All right, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Carell, founder of The Power of Our Story Coffee and Conversation. And today we are celebrating our Independence Day. It's a little early, uh, but we want to come together in appreciation for the freedoms and strengths that we have. Um, we're doing this by having a veterans and first responders storytelling jam session. And uh, today, um, I am so happy to have Scott Duncan facilitating this group today. Um, not only today, but he is also going to be uh, coming regularly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. PST to have present day issue conversations and also to have um, a time of helping people in transition from the military. So um, what I really appreciated about Scott, um, just seeing him on LinkedIn, is this is a man who can enter a conversation on social media, like one of those sticky conversations that most of us don't want to touch. Um, he will do it. He will do it well-equipped with so much humility and so much grace. And I thought about that a couple of things I would kind of watch and follow, see how it went down. Um, I thought, you know, there's so many people who simply want to just have a great conversation to get clarity on, on what's happening in this country. And so I was so grateful that Scott said, yes, I want to do this. I want to be that voice. I want to have that conversation. Um, and again, the key, what I saw was just the humility that he did it with and, and that he's equipped. So um, let me introduce Scott. He is a United States Marine Corps retired Lieutenant Colonel. He served 21 years as a Marine and has been working in the veteran space since 2013. During this time, he worked at two nonprofits and developed programs that recruited, trained, and placed veterans into jobs in the renewable energy sector nationwide at no cost to the veteran. He also worked with the Department of Energy, DOE, in the early stages of the Solar Ready Vets program development. He advises veteran-focused nonprofits and employers. He's a guest speaker on veterans issues and military transition, a mentor and veteran advocate. Now he's expanding my focus and reach into support of veterans issues and being part of the power of a story. Welcome, Scott. Well, thanks so much, Sarah. That's uh, talk about humbling. That's, <laughs> that's very humbling and much appreciated. I'm, I'm very excited to be coming on board to the platform to you know, open up the discussions that uh, I think we all need to have. And I believe that as veterans, we have a unique place uh, in the fabric of America and in the history of America. So who better than people who have served than, you know, folks like us that are willing to commit our time and energy to looking at issues that are important, not only to veterans and say first responders, but also social issues. So I think we're well equipped to talk about those things. And my hope is that we can have conversations that lead to good outcomes. So that's really the whole purpose for, you know, me wanting to be part of this and to expand my ability to hopefully help folks. So thanks again for the introduction. So a hey, real quick, a couple things, some uh, admin stuff, so to speak. Uh, not sure how many folks will be coming on live here. So here's how we're going to handle this. We're going to wind up, start, we'll start by, I'll introduce folks that are on the panel. I'll let them introduce themselves. And then once that's done, we'll shift gears and I'm going to start talking about the founding of our nation. So I'll, I'm going to get into some areas there that, you know, maybe some folks haven't talked about. Uh, we'll talk about folks that maybe some folks uh, haven't heard about, but that's all good. It's, it's history and it's important history. So we'll do that and we'll have a little bit of discussion with the panelists at that point. And then we'll shift gears in the second segment, the panelists are gonna share with us their American story, their unique experience as American, as an American, you know, something positive. So that'll be their role in the second segment. And then, after that segment, we'll open it up to questions and answers, like a Q&A session, or you know, folks have comments 
So for those that are you know, in the audience, so to speak, and I'm asking that you hold any of your questions or you know, comments to the very end for that designated period of time so we can get through the information that we have and that folks in the panel get their opportunity to, you know, to do what they came on here to do, which is participate. So, okay. One other thing, uh, I had a computer <laughs> issue. I, my laptop fell on the tile floor. And so I've been having problems. So I'm on my phone today, which I would, you know, want to be on a, on a laptop for a few reasons. One, I can see everybody uh, here on my phone. You know, you only have a limited amount of screens. So I do know that Rob Renz, who was one of our guests, he got it with me on LinkedIn early this morning, very early, and said he had some issues, uh, some things that came up that were, you know, very important. So he most likely will not be here. He said he could possibly get in on the tail end. You know, no worries. So we'll see. Uh, and Sarah, if you can do me a favor, if you can kind of take a look, uh, has uh, Elizabeth Hartman, has she come on board yet? Yes, she's on. Fantastic. Okay. Then at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and have the panel uh, introduce themselves. They have a little bit to say about who they are. Scott, and, I'm uh, sorry. I apologize. She is not on. She is okay. not on. I misread one. Yeah. Okay. No worries. Can you do me? Can you send her a just a quick uh, reminder? I mean, she may be, you know, caught up in something. If you could maybe just send her a quick little uh, comment on LinkedIn, just a DM, if you don't mind. Awesome. Okay. Well, with that said, we'll go ahead and start the introductions uh, with Herb Thompson. Uh, Herb, if you could please tell us a little bit about yourself. I think most folks probably have a good idea who you are, but it's nice to get it from the source. Oh, that's good. I'm still trying to figure out who I am, but no, I have to be here. I served 20 years in the army just over. Uh, I got to do my American dream, which is to be an American soldier. And then, you know, got out, wrote a best-selling award-winning book. And now trans going through the business world of trying to figure that out, uh, the whole new game there. Absolutely. You know, he, he he's a humble guy too. He was a Green Beret. He did a lot of really cool stuff, a lot of meaningful stuff. And as he talked about, he, he's got a book out, uh, Transition Mission. I, I ordered that book as soon as I saw it came out. I've read it a couple of times. You know, there's there's gold in their hills, though. So. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for all you do uh, in the community as well, Herb. Okay, uh, now let's go with uh, Olivia Nunn. Hi, everybody. My name is Olivia Nunn, and I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, so I know many of you. And for those that I don't, I am actually a retiring lieutenant colonel in the United States Army with 20 years. I become a civilian in September, so looking forward to that, and I've been sharing my journey. And uh, currently, I serve as a director of communication, both for Soldier for Life. I'm still active in that role. And I also work as a senior marketing manager for a government contracting company. So my wheelhouse is everything that has to do with social media, transition, brand management. And I am a DEI practitioner. So I bring that to the landscape and look forward to the conversation today. So thank you. And, and thank you for coming on board. I, you know, I, I think I in my mind was thinking that you had just transitioned, but so you're still in the final phases of your career, wrapping things up before you make that jump into the civilian world. I actually should be transitioned, to be honest. I just haven't let go of the reins at Soldier for Life because <laughs> like a good military officer, I believe in mission. And unfortunately they just don't have a backfill for me. And they've asked me kindly to kind of hang on in the background. So that's why I'm still hanging on, but technically I've, I've moved on in many ways. Well, that, that says a lot about you too, right? Uh, they they want to hang on to folks that uh, are good folks. So, so that, that's, that's kind of a good, good thing. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Jeffrey Knight. Yeah, hey, thanks, Scott. I, I, I got to follow those two. Um, hey, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, I'm Jeff Knight. Uh, I'm a 28-year uh, retired army officer. Um, it just means I was in a long time, uh, but uh, currently uh, working uh, as a people and process development manager right now uh, and a leadership development facilitator with Mission Six Zero as well. And so uh, just uh, it's it's good to be on here and uh, participating. 
All right, thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey and I share a lot of uh, back and forth uh, on LinkedIn. You know, we pay attention to each other's posts and we we DM each other occasionally. And uh, you know, Jeffrey, thanks for your time. It, it means a lot that you came on today. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Awesome. Okay, and uh, I know I didn't want you to follow the next person. That's why I went ahead and put you in where I did because I didn't want you to have to follow Melissa Hawkins. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's so great to be here. Thank you, Scott, for the opportunity. I am Melissa Hawkins. I am currently serving in the Marine Corps Reserve. I'm a Sergeant Major with 22 years in experience. Uh, I'm a Battalion Sergeant Major for 4th Combat Engineer Battalion, which is out of Baltimore, Maryland. And I'm also dual heading as a Senior Enlisted Advisor for the Human Performance Branch, which has actually been an exceptional experience that started with a LinkedIn connection. Um, and so on the civilian side where I've been able to kind of marry my two careers at the human performance branch is I work in sports medicine as a physical therapist and have been doing so for about 15 years. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to have a, a sergeant major on board. I was a battalion commander at one point and absolutely relied on sergeant major curves for everything sergeant majors do, uh, the things that you see and the things you don't see, the things you don't want to see, <laughs> they make things happen. And they provide sage advice and guidance. They connect you with uh, the folks that do all the work, the folks that do all the heavy lifting, the thinking. And uh, these senior enlisted advisors can't be thanked enough for what they do. They, they groom folks like me into hopefully being folks that are worthy of, you know, doing what they do, but but do it well because of, you know, the education they receive and, and the goodness that comes from that relationship, that special relationship that commanders and their senior enlisted forge together. So thank you for your time and, and being here. That means a lot. Now, one thing I don't want to forget, uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, Justin Pearson. He uh, owns a company called Proper Patriot. And I ordered, I have a few shirts from them and I ordered one the other day and I sent him a uh, direct message and said, Hey, uh, I ordered a shirt and I haven't seen anything tracking wise. I'm kind of hoping to get it by Thursday because I've got some stuff going on. And he said, Hey brother, no worries. Well, it showed up Monday really quick. And here's the shirt. We, the people, I think this is absolutely you know, complimentary to what we'll be talking about today. And I, I wear this shirt with pride and uh, thanks for getting this shirt here on time. So, okay. Uh, now looking at our folks, uh, one more ask here, Sarah, uh, has uh, Elizabeth hopped on yet? Uh, not yet. Okay. Well, yeah. we're just, we'll, we'll go ahead and push. And if she comes in, great. And uh, hopefully Rob has time to come in as well. So, uh, we have tough conversations in life, right? Sometimes conversations can be challenging. They can challenge us, you know, mentally, morally. Uh, today is a day where I want to talk about the goodness of America. But I'm also going to talk about some things and, you know, hopefully we'll have discussions on some things that uh, need to be talked about. And it's important that this time in our history that we understand that not everything maybe was the way it looked. And that's okay uh, because today we can look back in history and we can hopefully look at it in context and see how things have changed over the years. I, I really thought hard about how I, would, how I would address today in the format and the timing and the cadence, if you will, of the discussion. And what I decided to do was of course, I'm going to talk about the founding fathers, right? You know, there's a group of folks that most people know by name, who they are, and probably have some idea what they did in history and how important that was. And there are also some founding fathers that they probably wouldn't even recognize their names and the significance that they played in building our nation. There are women that contributed to the cause of independence and freedom. And you'll know some of those names, and there's a, a long list that you've just never heard of. And they contributed in a lot of different ways. And then there are also Americans 
well, they weren't Americans then, but they were they were slaves who contributed immeasurably, immeasurably to the freedoms that we enjoy today. They fought in the revolution. They risked their lives. They did this on the hopes that they too would be free. And we know our history and we know how long it took for that to happen. So there's there's goodness and there's also things that need to be discussed that are sometimes hard to discuss, but they're important. So I'm gonna talk about those things. And I'm gonna start out by talking about slavery and some key people that were involved in the war for independence. So yeah, bear with me because some of this is gonna be me reading because there's a lot. I can't remember all the names and I you know, wanna make sure that I do justice. And so just bear with me for a few minutes as I go through uh, some of the uh, data here and some of the names. I think this is relevant to the discussion we're gonna have. So when we look at the contribution of, of the slave population of America at the time. Now, slaves came from you know, many parts of Africa. They, it was a horrible transition you know, on ships to come here. They don't know the language. You know, <laughs> everything's different. And it's a terrible, terrible thing. I couldn't imagine experience what they went through. And I think we all understand that slavery is evil. It's wrong. It can't be condoned in any measure. Looking at that time in our history, as I mentioned, I think it's it's relevant to understand the history, but also to provide context to what was happening then and be able to decipher that and to look at it with the lens of where we are now as a nation and as Americans. So again, with that as the background, Approximately 9,000 black men served on the American side in the War for Independence, the American Revolution. And of those 9,000, about 5,000 were combat troops. They were actually on the front lines and engaged in combat. So when you look at the total number, the 20 some thousand, 25,000 plus patriots that fought in the revolution, about 4% of those. Or, or blacks. Let me go. I'll, I've got a couple of folks that I want to mention by name. Crispus Atkins, he was a martyr. For those of you that know history and that r remember the Boston massacre, there's a famous painting. And the painting captures the first volley. On the right side of the painting, there are the British regulars. And in the middle to the left, there are colonists. The first shot goes and it takes out Christmas. And he's the black man with his arms up and his head back being shot. And history denotes him as the first to fall. He was the first to die in our battle for independence. Salem Poor, he was a soldier. He purchased his freedom to fight. He was one of those men that thought that by fighting in this revolution that he too would gain his independence. He fought bravely. I'm, I'm sorry, I, it looked real quick. I mean, let me say one more thing. This is a caveat for me. Uh, over time, I've become uh, emotional when I talk about things. I was never like that. I think part of it is having daughters, maybe. They've softened me up. Uh, maybe it's partly serving in combat. Uh, but sometimes I'll you know, get a little emotional, and I hope that you give me a little bit of slack there, and, and I'll get through some of these times. So, I mean, it's all good. I'm, I'm fine with it, but you know, just, just a note there. So, uh, Salem Poor, again, uh, he purchased his freedom, and he fought in Saratoga, Mammoth, in a bunker hill. He was a warrior and he was known for his bravery. Then on a different side, a lady named Phyllis Wheatley. He's known as a patriot poet. She was, out, she was educated in the classics. 
She was a very intelligent woman. She became the first black woman and the third woman in the United States to actually publish a book on poetry. So think about what that meant back in that time. That's a tremendous accomplishment. She was an advocate for independence and she fought against slavery. And uh, many abolitionists would, would look to her for words of wisdom. She actually wrote George Washington about the goodness of his endeavor and what it meant to have someone like George Washington leading the country at the time that he did. There's a gentleman, Peter Sandler. He was a Minuteman. He too was renowned for his bravery in the battlefield. He fought at Lexington, Concord, and most famously at Bunker Hill, where he killed one of the lead officers on the British side. And then lastly, a gentleman named James Armistead. He spied with the Patriots. He was a smart man. He understood geography. He understood military movements. He was able to win the confidence of, of the crown, of the British military. So he infiltrated their ranks as a spy, and he was passing information back to Washington's army on troop movements, on uh, when supplies and munitions were being moved, from where they were being moved, where they were going, when shipments would come into ports. So he was a, a bounty of intelligence. And for those of you that know, again, history, the spy ring that Washington had was amazing. It, without the spy ring, we probably wouldn't have won the war because we got so much information and they had no idea the depth of information that was being passed from their words, their lips, their writings over to the Washington folks. So they knew a lot that the Brits had no idea. And uh, James Armistead was one of those men. All these folks risked their lives just as much as our founding fathers. They all had the same thing to lose, which was their lives. Our founding fathers, most of them were very well educated. They were wealthy. They came from wealthy families, not all of them. But over time, they became people of state, so to speak. So everyone had a lot to lose and a lot to sacrifice. Let me switch gears and talk a little bit about uh, some of the women. Now, there's a very long list I'm going to read to you. I'm not going to get into the details on every one. What I'm going to ask you to do is maybe take notes on some of these names and even the, the folks I just talked about and the folks that I will talk about. And then between now and maybe at the end of the weekend, take time and research some of these names and find out who these people were personally. Find out what they did, what their contributions were. And then you'll be able to determine for yourself how important they were to the founding of our nation because it all matters. And because of time, I'm gonna just go through a list of, of names here. So the first couple you'll know, Betsy Ross, Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, Dolly Madison, Penelope Barker, and I think it's important that we read these names, that we hear these names. Catherine Moore Barry, Martha Barrington, Elizabeth Bergen, Margaret Corbin, Lita Dara, Mary Draper, Emily Geiger, Nancy Hart, Anne Marie Lane, Dicey Langston, Sybil Lungan, Grace, excuse me, Grace, Ray, Grace and Rachel Martin, Mary, Lug, Mary Ludwig, Hayes, McCulley, otherwise known as Molly Pitcher. Molly Pitcher was with the camp. She followed the encampment as the uh, Patriot Army moved from place to place. She was there helping with logistics, with nursing, with food. Her husband was a cannoneer when he went down she stepped up on the line and resumed his position, loading the cannon and you know, making sure that it was able to fire. That's pretty damn brave. Rebecca Mott, 
Esther Reed, Deborah Sampson, Elizabeth Maxwell Steele, Mercy Otis, Prudence Wright, Elizabeth Zane. When we think about today, the contributions that women bring currently to our military, the sacrifices that they too have shared since the beginning of our country are, are huge, they're vast, but we haven't heard much of that history. At this point in time in our history, we need to be talking about that. So again, I, I ask folks to go back and look at these names, find out who these people were and the contributions that they gave to our country. Now, we know Betsy Ross, she's accredited with coming up with the first flag of our nation and presenting it to Washington. We know who Martha Washington was, the wife of George Washington. As he was away for seven years fighting our nation's battle, she was at home. They lost one of their children while he was in battle. She sacrificed largely. She was at without her husband. These other women that were key women were married to our founding fathers. If you're married, you know how important your spouse is to your career, to your mental and physical well-being. There's no way that these women didn't contribute to everything that happened, to the things that their husband did. You can't think that they didn't talk to their husbands about the issues of the day and share what they felt about it. I believe that happened. I know that happened. Didn't happen across the board every day, but these were important times. And husbands rely on the wisdom of their wives and the goodness that women bring to men. And so I know that that was on the heart of these men as they sat down and they considered what they were doing and if they should take a step in the direction that they ultimately took, which was to turn against the crown and to come together as 13 different colonies, all very different, with different people, different cultures, to form our country. Think about all the things that had to come together to make this happen. Some of these men, again, you're gonna know. My favorite is George Washington for a lot of reasons. I'll talk about him a little more at the end here. Ben Franklin, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, Samuel Adams, John Jay, Patrick Henry, Roger Sherman. Probably not a lot of folks heard about Roger Sherman. He is the only one of the founding fathers to sign all four founding documents. So if you're ever playing one of those games, uh, you know, it's a trivia game, you know, you'll get that one right. <laughs> he was the only one to do that. Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine was an incredible man. He wrote this book called Common Sense. It's a quick read. Common Sense is exactly what the title says it is. It's common sense. It was written to appeal to the common man and woman of the time to explain to them, hey, this is what we're doing. This is what America means. This is the importance of our endeavor. Kings and queens rule by decree. They believe that they're handed down the right to rule over everybody from, from God. And I think we all understand that that's not how things work. And Thomas Paine put together common sense to appeal to the masses, to get them to understand and to want to take part in this war for independence, this revolution. It sold 120,000 copies. Today, we talk about things going viral. That was huge. That was viral in its time. The amount of copies that went out and people read this and they understood this. And he was key as one of the folks that kind of became a recruiter. He compelled people to read and understand the importance of what would become the American experience and why it needed to be done. Uh, Richard Henry Lee, 
George Mason, James Monroe, Governor Morris, Robert Morris, John Marshall, Charles Carroll, Benjamin Harris, John Dixon, Benjamin Rush, John Witherspoon, William Samuel Johnson, Aaron Burr, and lastly, John Hancock. Most of us know John Hancock because he's got the biggest signature on the uh, Declaration of Independence. And people ask, why did he sign so large? Well, he said one of his friends who was going blind, he couldn't see well, he signed it large enough so that he could see that, yes, he did sign that document that would kick off the battle for our freedom. So when you talk about these folks, here's some other numbers to remember. There were 56 signers on the Declaration of Independence. I only read about, you know, 25 names, but there were 56 signers. There were 55 members of the Constitutional Convention. There were 14 presidents of the Continental Congress. There were 91 members of the first Congress who passed the Bill of Rights. As the government started, you had cabinet members, you had early Supreme Court members, and then of course you had the generals and admirals who ran the military executing the war. As I talked a minute ago, this is a very complex movement. Imagine being a colonist, whether it's up north or down south. Everyone had a very different culture, a very different way of living life. But these founding fathers, they understood that it was important to gain our freedom, individual liberties, the ability, our First Amendment, the ability to speak freely. A lot of times we take those things for granted now. I think people that serve in the military, I think they get it. I think they keenly get it. Because when you raise your right hand, you raise your right hand and you swear an oath to protect and defend the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. There's more to the oath. But as veterans, we understand and we are willing to put our life on the line for the goodness of our country, to defend our way of life, that document, that constitution. Well, these folks are the ones that understood that best because they're the ones that wrote these documents. They're the ones that sacrificed. Ben Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, you know, there's a lot of sayings that are part of our culture and a lot of them go back to Ben Franklinisms. One of the things that a lot of folks might not know, and it's not really a saying, but it's something that he said. When these men were putting together these documents, they were doing it in Philadelphia. That was the colonial capital of the time. And it was in the summer. And it was piping hot and very humid. And the clothes they wore were kind of restricted clothes and heavy clothes. And they didn't have AC. And they were shutting the doors and they were shutting the windows because they didn't want folks knowing what they were doing. So they were in these hot, stifling rooms and tempers would flare. The issue of slavery absolutely came up in the complexity of bringing together colonies, starting up an army that would fight the superpower of its time. Going back to that time, they, the English, were the preeminent superpower. It would be like some small nation taking on the United States, thinking they were going to win. Balancing all these things Something that was on the docket to discuss was the issue of slavery. Many of the founding fathers were slave owners. Three were not. Adams, John and Sam Adams, and Thomas Paine were not slave owners. Hamilton and John Jay were opposed to slavery. And later on in their lives, uh, they would work in New York to ban slavery early and do things to help folks who would uh, become free from slavery. So, you know, different times. 
So as they looked through the issue of slavery, they understood that the words that they were putting on paper, that we are all created equal. They believed that, but they lived in a time to where that wasn't the case. And in order to bring the country together, to convince these people to take up arms against the crown, to hold these Southern colonies in line with the colonies of the North to become America, they had to make deals. And it's a hard thing to, to swallow, but that's what they did. And they did so with the belief and the faith that there are future Americans, that future generations would take on that mantle, that once they solidified our country, once they fought this war with England, once they established the government, it would be in the hands of future Americans to resolve the issue of slavery. And we know it took about 100 years for us to get to the, the point to where we fought a war, the Civil War that ultimately ended slavery. A lot of things have happened since. And it's not my intent to talk about those things today, but I do want folks to understand that in context, it's important to know what our founding fathers were struggling with. And that just like us today, they were imperfect. They suffer from the affliction that we all suffer from, the, the human affliction, that we aren't perfect, that we make mistakes that sometimes we do evil things. But at that same flip in the coin, we also do amazing things. We can be loving, we can be intelligent, we can build things, we can have empathy. We can look at a document, we can put down words that are meaningful, words that apply to everybody. And those words, transcend time, and they knew it, and they were writing those words to apply to everybody. We, the people, these words matter. Jefferson, he was the intellect behind these words. Now, as a patriot, as someone who served a higher cause with the military, he wasn't any of that. He was a very flawed man. He was a slave owner. There's a lot, of contradict, a lot of contradictions in Jefferson's background that I won't get into, other than his, he wasn't a hero. He wasn't a military hero. But he was someone that was able to artfully put words on paper that were meaningful, that were enduring, that made up the essence of what America's about. So, yeah. He wasn't perfect, but if it wasn't for Jefferson's ability to articulate the importance of America and the freedom that we all share and that we all have a right to, he captured that and he put that on paper and he helped bring folks together. I kind of got sidetracked. I, I was going to talk about Benjamin Franklin and I got into kind of the daily grind that they were going through and the fact that they did talk about slavery. And so segue, segueing back into Benjamin Franklin's uh, comments, it was heated. Folks were arguing. The issue of slavery almost kept this whole experiment in freedom, this whole thing that we call America, it almost stopped it dead in its tracks. And Benjamin Franklin looked at all of them and said, gentlemen, and I'm paraphrasing, obviously. What we were doing, this endeavor, this is difficult. We are arguing here, and for good reason. But we must understand that we must hang together. For most assuredly, if we do not, we will all hang separately. Now, these were smart guys, right? And they probably knew, certainly at this point, because they're conspiring against the crown. They're, con they're building a government. They're doing the Articles of Confederation. All the documents that we 
cherished day. That's what they were doing. They were putting this together. And so you know that they had a good sense that if it went south, that they were all going to die. Well, Franklin had a way of conveying a message. And he wanted to make sure that in that moment, that they knew that if we don't do this, if we don't get past these issues and move forward, at this point, we will all be hung. And they, they thought about it. And they realized he was right. So from a planning perspective, as a Marine, you do it through the planning process. You only have so much time to plan before you need to get to tell your commander, hey, these are the options. Then he decides what he wants to go with, and then you execute. Well, think about it that way. There's only so much time you have to plan. So they're in the planning process, and they come up on slavery. And it's an issue that they can't settle. So they wind up putting it in the parking lot. So when you're planning and you get to an issue that's important, but for time's sake and to get a product, you have to move on. Doesn't mean that you don't come back to that at some point, but it's important enough that you, you write it down. You put it with the other important items, you put it in the parking lot. So that's what I'm saying. These folks understood the importance of slavery, that it was hypocritical to say all these things about freedom and not apply it to these people who were slaves. But they had a choice and they decided again that that's an issue that would be solved by future generations. Now, a lot of people today look at that very differently and they look at the founding fathers as being completely flawed, not understanding the context about why they did what they did. Things, things of worth, things of value don't happen overnight, right? When you look at the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire was not built today. I think we've all, we've all probably heard that. When you look at the pyramids in Egypt, those huge blocks and the generations of lives that it took to build those things, those things were all built by slaves. They were. Now, there were engineers, there were architects, there were folks that were important in that process, but it took human beings, it took the lives of people. These slaves, that's all they knew. Their whole lives, they were slaves. And their children were slaves. And these, this was generation. When you look at these things, do we tear these things down? Do you tear the Colosseum down because they were built by slaves? Do you tear the pyramids down because they were built by slaves? I'd say no. And honestly, we don't because they're still there. We have to remember history. We have to remember who was where in history. And again, the context of this. It took hundreds of years for us as Americans to get rid of slavery. But America did. England did. Other countries did not. It took many more years for them to get rid of slavery. Today, slavery exists, right? We have slavery in the marketplace. You have sporting apparel, you know, warm-up clothes, t-shirts, shoes that you buy that are put together on slave labor by children in other slave labor in other parts of the world. You have the sex slave traffic that's here in the United States. It's across the world. So slavery is it institutional like it was with African Americans in our culture, in our country? Thank God we've moved past that. We still have much more to do as a family, as Americans. And we must all understand these things and be willing to stand up to the things that we know are wrong. Maybe we shouldn't buy things. Maybe certain cell phones that you could buy that are made again, through some of this slave labor. Maybe you should make a conscious choice not to buy those things. So when we look at our founding fathers with the John Desai critically and say they were horrible because they didn't renounce slavery 
and make it a point in their time, they knew that they couldn't because the American experience would die. It's just that simple. So moving forward, let's say two or three generations from now, when our children's children are looking at us in time and they say, well, hey, those guys, they were all bunch of knuckleheads. They knew that folks who were enslaved were making those things they called smartphones, these little devices they carry, those shoes, those expensive shoes they were that they wore to run around to be healthy, those, the, the stuff they wore, they knew, but they ignored it. What's the difference, right? We have to look at this in context. That's so important. Now, I, I've, gone a, I've gone a little longer than I anticipated with this, and partly is because I get passionate, so I'll apologize for that up front. But I, I did want to read one thing. Actually, I want to read a couple of things about Washington, but just for the sake of time, I'm going to spare everybody. But I do want to read one part from this book here. It's called the, His Excellency George Washington by Joseph Phelps. This is a great read. This is one of the best books I've read on the importance of George Washington. How, when you look through history, our history, we only have a couple of folks that were indispensable. George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. You know, that's my opinion. I think mean, a lot of folks would agree with that. So, George Washington led by example. He was in the field with his men through the heat and through the blistering cold of the Northeast. He was with them on the battlefield, going through, risking his life with them and experiencing their hardships. He lobbied for them to be paid because at some point, the patriots that were fighting weren't getting paid. He was able to look at the bright side. He was able to encourage his men to continue to fight to be that guy that was positive, to instill in them the importance of why and what they were doing. He would go back and lobby for them with the politicians to raise money, to convince those folks to stay the course. He was the, the cornerstone. He was the centerpiece in this thing called America. 20-some years of his life, he dedicated to forging the American experience and ultimately becoming our first president. So towards the end of the war, folks weren't getting paid. And there were a number of officers who were willing to march on Philadelphia to the Continental Congress to siege, to lay siege to them and to force them to pay up back pay and to give them what they felt that they were due because they risked all on the battlefield for the American cause. This is called uh, the Newburg, uh, what's the right word? Uh, the, the Newburg conspiracy, where these folks had planned to do this. Well, Washington, through his spy network that I talked about, this came to him and he talked to his men and he decided that on the day that they were gathering to go march on Philadelphia, that he would call a meeting. And that they would all be required. He required all of his officers to come to this meeting. So he stopped that by requiring their presence because if they weren't there, he would know something was up. So he put a kink in their plan. So he did that. He had everybody meet. And I'm just going to read, for, read from the book. And this is the art of Washington. This is how skilled he was uh, in terms of knowing strategy and knowing emotion and knowing how to get to the core of somebody's inner being. So let me read this real quick. So this is a sighting from March 16th of 1783. Washington had just entered the Newburgh building at Newburgh, a large auditorium recently built by the troops and also called the Temple. About 500 officers were present in the audience. Horatio Gates is chairing the meeting. A rich irony since Gates is most probably complicitous in the plot 
to stage a military coup that Washington has come to quash. Everything has been scripted and orchestrated beforehand. Washington's aides fan out into the audience to promote applause for the general's most crucial lines. Washington walks slowly to the podium and reaches inside his jacket to pull out his prepared remarks. Then he pauses. The gesture is almost certain planned and pulls out from his waistcoat a pair of spectacles. Recently sent to him by David Rittenhouse, the Philadelphia scientist. No one has ever seen Washington wear spectacles before on public occasions. He looks out at the assembled officers while adjusting his newly his new glasses and says, gentlemen, you will permit me to put on my spectacles, for I have not only grown gray, but almost blind in the service of my country. Several officers began to sob. The speech itself is anticlimactic. All thoughts of military coup die in that moment. Think about that. No one had ever seen him wear, wear glasses. He spent his life in the field with his men. And he pulls out glasses. And when he puts them on because he can't see, that signifies the sacrifice that he has grown old with them in this battle. And that was enough to get them to realize, man, we're almost at the finish line. Let's not screw this up. The Washington is noted in history for turning down being our king, turning his sword over to the newly formed government and walking away. No one had done that. The king of England said, you know, George III, the guy that, you know, that lost the war. He said of George Washington at the end of George Washington's second term, he said, if George Washington turns around and goes back to his farm to become a citizen of America, that he will be the greatest man of his time and maybe the greatest man in history because he goes back to his farm and he is not a king. George Washington understood that. And if it wasn't for Washington, the sacrifice and all of the things that he was able to do, we all wouldn't be sitting here today having this conversation. We wouldn't have the things we have as Americans. We have so much to learn as Americans, you know, all of us. But my hope is that we can talk about these things that have been problematic and have been troubles and stains in our history, this whole thing on slavery. It's important to talk about. It's important to know it was wrong, but it's also important to know that our nation has taken strides over the year. Not perfect, not immediate. We've learned, we've made mistakes, but I believe that we always in the end do what's in the best interest of America and its people. We have strived to do that. When you look at the 60s, all the things that came about, when you look at what it meant for the folks of the 60s to push, to get everyone to understand that Black people are Americans, that they deserve everything that white people in America deserve. Martin Luther King was pivotal in his time. And if you look to what he says, judging people about the content of their character, not the color of their skin, I think we're falling back on his words here lately. And I think that it is important for all of us to understand that we are here together. We all bleed the same color. We are all Americans. And it's our duty to think about these things but also to live and act upon these things, to be good people, to take care of each other. So 
with that, what I want to do, and again, I apologize, I was a little bit long. I want to open this up to the panelists that are here and uh, so we can talk about anything I've, I've said. If you guys have questions or if you feel uh, maybe differently or if you want to add something to the, to the conversation, I want to open the floor real quick uh, for you guys to be able to do that. So please. That was so powerful. That was, that was, uh, that was just powerful. Thank you, Scott. Um, I'm actually jumping in here because when we have powerful stop talks, I know it takes a while for people to process and, you know, to be able to respond. And, um, so I just, uh, I'm very moved by your talk. I, there's so much in there that I just didn't know. I've never heard it shared in that way. So Scott, thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Hey, Scott. So I, I'm, I'm going to have to leave very shortly and I apologize for that, but I'd love to jump in for this for just a second. Uh, I, I am full agreement with Sarah on that. Um, that there's so much in there. You can, we can go on for another four or five hours, uh, on, on those subjects on that. Um, you know, a few things that, uh, that, that I picked out of there and I wrote them down. So apologize if I'm reading my notes, but, um, the the history of of those uh that you mentioned at the very beginning the the african americans the blacks the women um those it, it can be stated understated of how much those need to be highlighted um and that even comes from that even comes from my current day in in the in with my wife who i've been married happily for 28 years um and she is stuck with me uh, throughout that she true mill spouse, um, and the families, the, the, the people that support us in the, in the military, um, serve probably in my opinion, more than we do, uh, in, in that regard. And so, uh, you know, th those are just really powerful things that you said in that regard. Um, it, just the most underrated in, in my opinion. Um, and, and the other two points I, I, I'd like to comment on is when you talked about flawed, flawed men, uh, we are all flawed in some manner. And, you know, it, it goes back to, Hey, we can't throw rocks in glass houses. Um, and, you know, if you look at even my own personal history, there are things that I'm not proud of in that, but over time I've changed, I've learned from those things. And that I think is one of those things that we that that we're lacking today is the 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 group understanding, empathy, and then meeting in the middle, at where where we need to, which is where we need to be. We we have many many flaws. We have many things that we need to work on. Uh, all of those things. Um, and then the final comment that I'm going to make here, uh, and again before I before I do that, I appreciate so much. Uh, for you inviting me on this. Um, I'm just up against the work thing right now. Um, but the last thing is when you come back to it and you talk to, and, and there's a lot of veterans, there's a lot of allies, there's first responders that are listening to this. But when you come back to it, when, when George Washington said those, I, I stand before you, I, I'm not even sure what it was, but speckled and gray uh, because the service of our country and every, sing, every person on this call right today um, can identify with that to this day. And that goes to the service that he had and the love for this country, uh, despite, despite, and, and those other men and women too, uh, despite the flaws that they may have had. So I appreciate you giving my peace and inviting me on this journey. Uh, absolutely, Jeffrey. And, and again, I, my time management skills went right out the window. I, I, I should have been better, <laughs> but, uh, I, I, so I, again, I apologize for that. But uh, Dave, do you have any quick, uh, quick American story from Jeffrey? Uh, your experience? Anything you want to quickly share? Yeah, you know, I, I on on that high, and I know this was on the, the next section. So, uh, and, and I again, I apologize that I've got to take off. But uh, you know, for me, when I when I look back at my childhood, um, and, and to me, what what American, you know, what, what America is. I think was identified or identified to me of what my um, 
what my mom uh, went through when we were children. Um, and single mother of three, uh, living in a trailer park on welfare, working full time, you know, not, not working full time at that time, but uh, when she was able to full time work and putting herself through uh, through school to become a nurse anesthetist. I, I probably didn't say that right. So everybody can make fun of me. Um, but that to me in and of itself is talks about that. It's the it's the pursuit of happiness. It's the um, it's the opportunity that is granted to us. Uh, and that opportunity was not free, is not free. And for me, that kind of, I think, probably began my journey, uh, you know, into understanding what this is all about. And I, I wrote this, uh, you know, I, I wrote this in, in, in the books, uh, uh, the, uh, I forget the name of the book. <laughs> anyway, but anyway, I'm so thankful for that lesson and to be able to watch that. And to me, that's what America's about. Amen. Awesome. Hey, Jeff, I know you got to go. I, uh, thanks for your time today and, and you know, for your comments. Uh, those things are important. And thanks for sharing. You bet. Thanks, Absolutely. guys. Really appreciate it. All right, brother. Take care. Okay, I would say, uh, Scott, that um, as a communicator and as a Army Public Affairs officer, I've always pushed the envelope for our leaders to think. And what I'm going to challenge in this dialogue today is that while a lot of the things that you talked about was a great history lesson, I couldn't help but think as I looked across the audience here on the screen that we're having this conversation about race and diversity, but yet the race that we're talking about is not even represented in this conversation. And I think that allyship is very important and that's something that we don't talk often about, but we can't have a true discussion if they don't have a seat at the table. I talk about that both from a race perspective and a gender perspective. And I say that a lot of times to men who forget that women have a right to have a seat at the table. Everything from talking about the way we legislate health laws and how we can advocate for ourselves and women's bodies, like how we can um, be represented and what are the best things that represent our female body that a man has no idea about. To everything about leadership positions and how we advocate for that. And at the same time, it's reminding women when we have those discussions and that seat at the table, we can't forget the other 50% of the group, which is men, and that they must remain at that table. So I say the same thing when we have that dialogue about race. We, if we're going to have that dialogue, we should have that dialogue with not only our allies, but also those that in which we're discussing so we can get a perspective from their side. And then also part of that race discussion is, um, you know, we've experienced this in the last year, we had this whole Black Lives Matter movement, and then it transitioned through the months into stop Asian hate, and we're not even having a discussion on that. That is a very real topic of some of the things that are going on in our nation. And so it race, the discussion of race isn't a black and white issue. It is an issue that affects every single one of us, how we are going to live through it, and how we're going to pass that to the next generation. And I think that's the pushback that I'm going to give on, on today's discussion is that that discussion has to be held with everybody at the table. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And, and I would, I don't take it as pushback. I, I take it as, you know, as it's meant. Uh, so, so let me, let me, let me address that. Then. Uh, I did ask, uh, you know, a couple of folks that I know uh, who are African-American to come on and, and they did not that they didn't want to, they just timing wise. Uh, one of my really good friends who is a Marine Colonel who is retiring in July, he said, brother, I would absolutely love to be out here with you, but I can't. That day I've got things going on and I can't move the count. So, you know, I really wanted him to come on board because of the perspective that he brings to any conversation, but also for the what you talked about having representation on here. So, you know, I, I was aware of that and cognizant of the fact that that's important. And I did ask folks to come on. And the, the folks that you see are the folks that said, yes, I will come on. So, but but you're right. And everything you said, I absolutely agree with. And there's only, there's only so much bandwidth, right? And I, and I kind of blew it by talking too much. But, you know, you only have so much time to talk about these things. And the, the bulk of my discussion 
I wanted to focus on the history at the time of the founding of our nation. And, and those were the people, you know, chiefly that were there at the time, right? You know, the folks in the colonies came from all around the world. You know, they, they, they weren't just English, right? It wasn't just the issue of obeying the crown of England. You know, people came from all over the world, came to the, the colony. So there's a lot of, you know, different people culturally, but the things you said, I absolutely agree. You know, women's issues, you know, what you talked about with, with age and hate, those things that are happening. We need to be able to talk about that. And that's what I hope this platform will be. And as I go forward, I'm going to be bringing on folks to talk about those issues. I've got to find the folks that are willing to do it. Obviously, you are. So I will come back to you uh, as often as you'll be willing to want to talk uh, in this on these platforms, on these issues. So I, I appreciate the fact that, that you're here and that you, you know, felt uh, compelled to, to bring up those issues because they're important and they need to be talked about and the right folks need to have those discussions. Absolutely. No, and Can I, I think you, it? I think that leads into, um, you know, my American story, right? Like I've shared, I am first generation Korean American. My parents came here, you know, wanting to chase the American dream. And, and I've shared, I've been never enough, right? When you're a biracial person growing up in the seventies and, you know, late seventies, eighties and nineties, you know, that's a different time frame. That is a different way that America looked at culture versus today growing up when I brought Asian food, I was made fun of, but yet now you're culturally, um, you know, you are culturally aware and you're awesome. If you know how to go eat at a Korean restaurant and know the difference between the types of sushis that are out there, which I think is awesome. And that's something that's going to be different for my children who are multiracial, right? Cause their father is black. And so, you know, that that's a big deal for me is that not everyone's adventure into what they view as American story is going to be the same. And we have different challenges. And I love the fact that what is beautiful now is that we can have that discussion, that people are willing to ask that instead of brush it aside. Because I remember as a child, I was told, stop speaking Korean. My teacher told my parents, stop speaking whatever language is at home because this is America and we speak English. So I've lost that part of myself. I, I am no longer fluent in Korean because I lost that as a child. But yet today, the cool thing is how many languages do you speak? And you should know more than just English. So what I am hopeful for and what I'm excited is that my upbringing is different for today's generation. And that brings me hope that we have a better future for America. Can I pop in? Here, um, Olivia, listen, thank you so much for, for bringing that up and sharing. And I, I just um, want to just even share really quickly, too, um, as just kind of founding this, the power of our story. Um, we do have a group even personally that we are involved in kind of mentoring the next generation that's half black, half white, who we have talked for a year and a half a year after, you know, George Floyd, really in-depth conversations. And I think that is exactly what you're talking about. That is the hope with the power of our story is just the freedom to have these conversations. So, um, yeah, I, I think Scott was just saying again, that he was kind of doing the foundation now, but we will be continuing these conversations. And, um, and I, Perhaps I was going to piggyback on what you had just said. I just appreciate, oh, and I think too, I think what you're, what I envision with the power of our story is being able to bring in all these angles um, more from, from the angle of really just sharing your life experience. What is it like for you to be a Korean American? What is it like for you uh, to be married to an African-American, have biracial children. So it's the power of our stories, I think, that really reach our each other's hearts um, versus what can happen is like a division. It's the kind of divide. It feels angry or accusative. And it. so that's what our hope is, is just to really bring things together. So um, I hope that helps also just to introduce the spirit of what we're trying to do with these talks. But um, Olivia, thank you. Way to get in there. My goodness, that was awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, well, uh, on that, uh, it, it, does anyone else want to talk a, a bit more about, uh, you know, my diatribe here and, and uh, you know, 
Hey, anybody? Uh, Euler? <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in here, Scott. Can, can you hear me okay? Yeah, please do. So I, I'm glad that you actually started with the, the historical piece because um, I think, well, gosh, if, if, if George Washington decided he wanted to be king of America, could you imagine how things would be so different nowadays and, and all of the things that we look back on, like our constitution, our declaration of independence, those things wouldn't even exist today or, or, or at least would look different in a different form. And, and sort of on a, on a Marine Corps note, right? Um, if it wasn't for George Washington and, and his need for an amphibious troop movement, you know, we may not have a Marine Corps, right? So, um, right, as, as you know, November 10th, 1775, Second Continental Congress and Tun Tavern, if it, if it wasn't for uh, them authorizing uh, the two battalions of those Continental Marines, our Marine Corps would not exist today. So uh, lots of lots of things that, that could be, that could look a little bit different. And so for me, my American story really kind of centers around that. Um, you know, I was raised to love America, right? You know, where we had a, a sense of uh, American pride, you know, we waved flags, we went to parades, we sang uh, American theme songs in school. Um, and I, I felt always felt like a very strong sense of devotion to America, but I didn't really understand my love for America until I served. Um, and, and as you know, in the Marine Corps, um, our history is everything. Um, and I think it's that sense of pride in our history that's ingrained in you from day one um, that really allows you to appreciate like that who, what, where, when, how um, of how we got to where we are today and, and that we really are lucky to have the freedoms that we do have, to have these kinds of very difficult, perhaps uncomfortable, but very transparent conversations. Um, and I think for me, serving overseas really reaffirmed a lot of that. When you realize in, in almost a very surreal fashion that, that how free we really are, um, and, and you realize also just how important it is to protect those liberties and those freedoms. And you know, and I would say like America, you know, despite our history and checkered past and even our shortcomings, um, you know, we continue to persevere and grow, we evolve and, and we hold ourselves accountable to that. Um, and I think there's so much goodness in that. And, and sure, certainly there's, there's room for growth and, and we're continuing to evolve. Uh, but that, but that's what I love about America. You know, I, that's my American, my American story. My, my patriotism really comes from that sense of, you know, determination and tenacity and spirit um, that, that comes with being an American. And, and I would say even serving in the Marine Corps um, is a, a, the opportunity to sacrifice, if you will, for our country is in order to protect our honor is, is really everything to me. Uh, and I think that, you know, patriotism doesn't need, it shows up many ways. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to serve in the armed forces. Um, but yeah, you know, and I'll give an example, you know, now I'm a mom, I have a family. Uh, and it's so important to me that I really share that same sense of appreciation and understanding about that uh, with my kids. Um, specifically, you know, yes, we talk about our freedoms and how lucky we are. You know, my, my kids are of an age now where they're seeing things, they're hearing things, they're asking questions, and we have conversations uh, about it so they understand. Um, but, you know, since they were infants, I, we still sing American theme song. We still sing Grand Old Flag and America the Beautiful so that we, so that we don't lose that sense of, of, of patriotism that makes our country so special. Um, and we talk about what holidays represent like Memorial Day, for example. So, um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm appreciative of this country. I am appreciative of the opportunity to serve because I think putting those two pieces of my life together has, has really made me more proud than ever. Uh, and I'm so excited to share that with my family and obviously now everyone that's listening. <laughs> well, that was tremendous. I, I tell you what, I thank you so much. And, you know, when you said Tun Tavern, that, that reminds me, uh, you can see this if it comes in clear or not. Oh, <laughs> yes. yeah. It's kind of hard, to, but this, this is a, a very, very, very old stamp. And of course, I grew old and serves my country too, so I've got to put my <laughs> spectacles on. Uh, it says 1775 Tun Tavern in uh, Philadelphia, U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, I, I got this from someone that he was a Navy civilian when I worked at Expedition and Warfare Training Group Atlantic. And uh, he had served as a Navy officer. He was our comptroller, and uh, when I left, he he got this for me, and it's it's been with me on my desk, and now here 
on display. So that that kind of went to the heart there. But you know, something else you said, Melissa, about you know folks that have served, and then also folks who haven't served. Right? As Americans, we all have very different backgrounds, and the way we do it now, it's all volunteer. Folks aren't drafted, and I think it's important for us as veterans to remember because. You know, it's easy to forget that, hey, just because you serve doesn't mean that someone who didn't doesn't love America every bit as we who have served do, right? You know, that's that, that should be something that everyone should just take at face value. You know, I, I've got friends that are some of the best Americans, some of the best people. They didn't serve, but I know they love this country. I know they're good people. You know, so when we look at people and we challenge motives and, you know, we think about, well, you know, they don't know because they didn't have this experience. Well, yeah, maybe, but maybe they had a different experience and we have to be aware of that and be willing to listen to those things and, and know that there's different ways to, to love this country. You know, we should all want to do our best as Americans. And uh, thank you for, for what you said. That's, you, you covered a lot of ground. <laughs> Much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Herb, uh, are you still there? Yeah. You have any? Well, I'm going to just go ahead and transition then uh, into uh, what Melissa just did. You know, if you have anything to say about the past, you know, 40, 50 minutes, fine. If not, let's just go ahead and transition into, you know, your American experience and, you know, what you came on to talk about, if you could, Herb. I'm not seeing Herb. Yeah, he may have punched out after because we're we're right at an hour and uh, twenty seven minutes. Yeah. So okay, well, it looks like I don't think Elizabeth uh, wound up showing up, and uh, yeah. we know that Rob wasn't coming in. So that being said, we, we still have a few folks that are that are here listening. Uh, so at this point, let's go ahead and we'll, we'll open it up for, for folks in the audience that if they've got questions or, or comments that they want to add to uh, the conversation here. Feel free. I'd like to add to it. Hey, yeah. Janet. Um, as Canadians, we, part of our school, when I was going to school, our curriculum took in the American uh, history as well. But I like the depth that you went into from the origin. And uh, I love my neighbors to the south. You talk about emotional, that happens too. So uh, you all have contributed. Like Sarah, I can't thank you enough for today. I was just gonna pop on, but I've been sitting here since you started this morning and all of it is valuable. And we so need these stories to get out to the open. Olivia, thank you for answering my question there about the book. I so appreciate uh, you know, your story too. Um, we need all of us. We need all of us together. Amen. Thank you, Janet. Yeah, uh, real, real quick, Sarah, uh, since I'm on my phone, my ability to, you know, have kind of a omnivision with any text or questions, you know, I, I, I can't see that unless I go through a number of screens. So yeah, were there any questions uh, folks posed uh, on, on that text platform? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, I think people were just engrossed in the conversation. Um, we just we have one from Janet who just just shared, and she just okay. really enjoyed that. Um, yeah, that's it. Anybody Chris, have anything? Chris has his name up or his hand up. Oh, Chris, yes. Yeah, please. Yeah, absolutely fantastic talk, and I think that. Uh, I'm driving through the mountains right now, so my uh, reception's kind of been sparse, but something that I think that was brought up that absolutely hits home for me, uh, and, and it's so valuable, especially on the 4th of July, we seem to concentrate so much on uh, those of us who have served in the military and so on, and I'd just like to reemphasize what you said. I think, Melissa, there was you that, uh, and then uh, reemphasize that this, this country's founded on the founding principles and, you know, everything's kind of um, been procured through the military. 
But that's not the end of the story. That's a very small part of the story. Everybody does their small part in this country to make it go. Um, I remember when I came, I was in Afghanistan from uh, until December of 02. And somebody told me, thank you for your sacrifice and all this and that, which was very appreciative. But in my perspective, that's just a small part, right? That's my small part. You all did your small part. But everybody that refused to give up after the attacks of 9-11 and did everything that they could to make our lives normal, it would have been easy for so many people to go into their little shell and let America shut down and let America be, um, you know, scared. And, and No, everybody kind of stood up. They put up their flag. They rolled their shoulders back like we all do, puffed their chest out and said, no, we're Americans. We're going to keep driving forward. And that, to me, is the real big story about America. The military, it's a very small part for us, right? It's a very, very small part. But everybody else also keeps this thing going forward. And so, you know, further the point of uh, you, Melissa, uh, and I think uh, the gentleman that just jumped off here, it's our families that are actually making a big sacrifice. We rose our hands. We knew what we signed up to do. Um, it's, I think that it's very few of us that says, hey, I think that uh, for the worries about when we leave, hey, I hope I make it. Back. Um, but even if it's training exercise, our families, every time we walk out that door, they say, hey, we, don't, we hope we don't get that call. So um, absolutely fantastic talk. I, I take so much every time I hear you guys speak. It's, it's very humbling. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Chris. Uh, much, much, uh, much appreciated. Hey, where are you, where are you headed? You're sitting off in the mountains? Very much. I'm in Washington State. We're heading uh, to our uh, little vacation spot in eastern Washington, a little place called Moses Lake. Oh, nice. So we're uh, crossing the I-90 uh, pass from western to eastern Washington. No, oh, that's beautiful country up there. Uh, may God speed to you and safe travels. Uh, thanks for, for uh, checking in with us here. Thanks, guys, and uh, happy 4th of July, and thank you everything for every single one of you, what you do. Yeah, well, yeah thank you. Thanks, thank Chris. You. Okay. Um, all right. Well, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, an hour and 26 minutes and, uh, this is my first go at this. Uh, I always say, I, you know, we always learn as we do, um, uh, that's how you learn best by doing, uh, I've learned that I need to really watch the clock and not get, you know, uh, engrossed, uh, in, in the conversation, especially when I'm talking, <laughs> But uh, because I, I want to be, you know, and seriously, I, I want to be mindful of people's times, especially our guests. I, I feel bad that uh, some of those folks probably had to go, and, and I get it, you know. Uh, so, uh, okay, well, do we have any uh, any final thoughts, uh, folks that are that are listening, uh, panelists, or Sarah, before I wrap this thing up? Yeah, I was just looking to see if anybody else was unmuting. Um, I, I, I do want to tell you, Scott, that to me, what in the whole spirit again of, you know, the Independence Day of about celebrating our country, um, your talk was like more than I could have imagined in I, you know, I, I kind of feel like, you know, you guys are all really, um, amazing people. And so I wanted to just, whatever is on your heart and how to take this and run. Uh, but what I really appreciated is it was just perfect for the situation. And I feel like it's a kickoff. You kicked off with the foundation, um, of what you want the theme of your talks to be your conversations. And then again, just like what Olivia had brought in too, there's so many different conversations happening now that I, I just feel like you open the door for everybody to come in. And, and I also agree with Olivia. I know I invited a lot of people too of all different colors. It's just, this is what showed up today. This is who showed up. So hopefully that will mix. Hopefully you know, we can get many different conversations happening and it really just come to some clarity and some unity and um, all the things that we're hoping to help make this country strong. So um, again, thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate you all being on here. Scott, I thought you did a phenomenal job and it looks like Papa Ron is about to say something. Listen yeah. up, everybody. Well, you know, when, when we start hearing all of the nuances of things that we may or may not know about. Uh, I, I'm a fan of this one podcast where the, um, where the theme is things I, things I know, 
uh, things I don't know about things I know about. You know, I, I know about ladies, but there's things about ladies I don't know. You know, there's mysteries there. And when we get to hear them from the nuance, uh, having three daughters uh, and that, uh, you know, I, I, I get to know a bit of what they say it feels like to feel things in the way they feel things. And I'm saying that kind of nuance because sometimes I don't even know how, how to even think about things from the other person's lens. Um, and, 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 and I appreciate what Olivia said, but keeping the half of the room in the room to talk to while we're trying to bring other halves into the room. Uh, I, I tell you what, as a, I'm gonna say this very out loud, as a, as a white male, Christian, heterosexual, conservative Republican who works in social services, I feel like I get so pigeonholed into this thing that I can't be, I can't be human and humane at the same time. And, and you talk about a group that is, that is right now, it's okay to discriminate against, it's okay to bash, it's okay. And being Southern too, I mean, I got it bad. And, you know, and, and there is so much the culture that Olivia, than the food we eat, the clothes we wear, the art we put on our, our, our walls, you know, I mean, culture is a river that runs deep within us and you can't go deep and stay shallow at the same time. So much of conversation feels superficial. Like we're just, we're saying platitudes and, 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 uh, you know, one day at a time, you know, it's like those, those things that, that we just, it, 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 I know that people don't know the way they talk about things. And so you've opened up the doors here and I'm, I'm learning. I, I mean, if we say, oh, well, we're flying to Mars, that's like going a, a centimeter on a 50 mile trip, you know, it, it, in terms of the whole universe or all the way out to the stars. It's like, you, you know, so this is a, I mean, it's, it's going to take some special scuba gear to go deep into this thing and find the treasures. I'm just saying. <laughs> That's why we have Scott. I agree. <clears throat> I'm looking forward to all the exploring too. I was just telling Olivia also that I'm, um, I'm excited to see the possibilities in this group to be able to explore these different conversations. Um, and I, I feel like Scott, I think you'll do it really well. And well, that's I why I always bring that voice, right? I am that I am that Army PAO that has always challenged the commander to think beyond what they should and to be uncomfortable, to be comfortable with the uncomfortableness or rep, you know, because you're right, we're not gonna fix anything if we keep having these shallow conversations. We have to dig deep and we have to come with thick skin and we have to understand that we all wanna make it a better place. Um, you may or may not know it, Olivia. That's the bull rider's motto. You need to get comfortable being uncomfortable, grab a seat and stay sticky. You yeah. know, it's, <laughs> you it gotta is. get comfortable being uncomfortable because these are some uncomfortable times. It is, but I'm excited because I think we are moving in a direction that this country hasn't moved in a long time. It's unfortunate that there's events that have transpired that has gotten us to this moment, but at the same time, it has opened eyes in a way, eyes and hearts and minds in a way that we haven't been able to in a long time and to really check our biases at the door and to effectively and cohesively move to a better future. So that I'm thankful for. Absolutely. And just to debunk something that I hear a lot um, amongst the veteran circles, uh, I don't know if it happens in others, is we don't see color, we see unit. I mean, to say you don't see color means you can't see me, you can't see anybody. It's like there's, I mean, it's, I mean, <laughs> there are a lot, there's a broad, you know, it's bigger than a 64 box of, of crayons, I'll tell you. It's like, it's, there's a lot of color and nuances between color and it's just part of the spectrum and I think it's time we really acknowledge and you know learn about history whether we're going to tear buildings down or build buildings up uh, I just want I just hope that a hundred years from now when they're looking back at how we handle this time that that they give us a little bit of grace 
like I would hope we give a little bit of grace to those who preceded us and to get to this point, so. All right. Well, guys, uh, again, I, I wanna thank the panelists that, that came on uh, and for their time and the comments uh, made. I think they were all very constructive uh, and they came from a, a point that's wanting to, to help us move forward. And we have to remember that we all have different experiences and we have to be, as uh, Olivia said, thick skinned and be uncomfortable, be willing to be uncomfortable because there are things that uh, you hear about our history that are uncomfortable, right? There are things that are happening right now that are uncomfortable, but we have to be able to take that deep breath and talk about it because if we don't talk, you know, think about relationships. If you don't talk to your significant other, how are you going to come together on anything? I mean, some things will just fall in line, but the important things you have to have dialogue on. You have to be willing to talk. Now, it's okay to disagree on things because that's life. But to stay moving forward, you have to come together and you have to agree on things of principle. And you have to be willing to compromise. And I think we've lost the ability to compromise here, you know, over the past few years. And you don't get anything done without compromise because it can't be all one way or all the other way. And I, I see us being diametrically opposed politically. We need to close the gap. Again, be strong on principle. But there are so many areas that we can come together if we're just willing to listen talk and listen to each other and then take action. And, and that is what I hope to do in this forum is to bring the right people in that have the right topics to talk about these things and not just sit at home complaining about it to the wall or you know to your, your friend, but to folks that need to hear this, folks that wanna have a voice, folks that are willing to talk and go back and forth. So that's the goal here. That's, that's my intent. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for, for having us on. Thank you for my first shot at this. Uh, next week, uh, same time, as Sarah said, this is going to be a weekly thing. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it at an hour and, and be you know, a little more aware of, uh, of time. But uh, next Thursday, the 8th of July, 11 o'clock Pacific, I'm going to have uh, Dr. Teresa Larson on. She served as a Marine. Uh, she now uh, owns and, and runs Movement RX. It's about uh, you know wellness, uh, physical, mental, spiritual wellness, helping folks who have been injured, getting through those injuries. Uh, and she's she's got so much to bring uh, to this platform. Uh, she has a book called The Warrior. We're going to talk about the book, and we're also going to talk about uh, you know some of her life experience, uh, parenting. You know, I'm a dad of, of two daughters. Uh, she has two boys. We're going to talk about her parents. It's going to be a, an in-depth conversation about, you know, unique experiences, but how similar life experiences can be with folks and the goodness that you achieve, uh, you know, once things kind of come together and as you grow as a person. So it, it should be a good conversation. So I'll leave it with that. Thank you guys so much. I'm going to turn it back over to you to, to close this out, if you will. Okay, I just want to thank you all. Um, I, really hearing everybody's voice, everybody's response, um, hearing, I really feel like we just had a, a, a fascinating history conversation. Um, and I appreciate the emotion too, Scott. I feel like it connects me to our history even more. Um, so I, I, I really appreciate it. You guys, thank you so much for everything. And I really hope you'll come back and join us. Um, Olivia, Melissa, um, you were, thank you so much for coming and sharing your experience. And I hope we see you again here. It would be great to have your voices. So thanks again.